Thank you very much, Xavier, for start. Thank you for welcoming me here today. Um, I would like to talk to you about wine as a symbol of transformation. And I would like to talk to you about how wine, during its life, undergoes several different transformations. We will start at the beginning with the wine's birth in the vineyard as the tiniest pot. Then we move on to the winemaking. Later, we'll look at the élevage in the cellars. And finally, we are at the bottling of the finished product. Then we will look at the different transformations that happens later on in a wine's life, from when I open the bottle and expose it to oxygen, what kind of changes happens then, um, and what happens if I serve the wine at different temperatures, if I choose to aerate it, and if I serve it with different types of food which is very much what I have been doing for the past 15 years of my life. Finally, we will look at um, what happens in a wine's life even later if I choose to bottle age it for many, many years. And we'll look at wine as an investment and how the market price of a wine can transform. And we will also, the most exciting part, if I have to say so myself, taste a bit of wine at some point. So let's start in the vineyard. The year starting with pruning in January and February, the grower cuts away most of the canes from the previous year's activity and leaving only a few, which will then produce shoots. In spring, the wine then begins its annual growth cycle with bud break. And in the northern hemisphere, this takes place around March, when the average temperature reaches around 10 degrees Celsius. Tiny buds on the vine start to swell, and eventually, shoots begin to grow from the buds. Ultimately, these shoots will sprout tiny leaves which will then mean that the vine can begin its photosynthesis and this way produce the energy that is necessary for the growth. Around May, early June, when the average daily temperature reaches 15 to 20 degrees, the flowering with begins with small flower clusters that appear at the tip of the young shoots. And it is <clears throat> Excuse me, it is during the flowering stage that the pollination and fertilization takes place. Fruit set follows flowering almost immediately, and the fertilized flower begins to develop a seed and a grape berry, berry which protects the seed. And this stage is uh, very, very important because it determines the size of the crop that we will end up with and the amount of the wine of wine that will be produced in the end of the day. Around the end of July, August, we reach the stage of viraison, where we see sort of the first proper transformation with these berries. So at this stage, the grape berries are green and very hard, containing very little sugar and a lot of acidity. Viraison, <coughs> maybe a bit of water, excuse me. Maybe a bit of wine, <laughs> <clears throat> so, like I said, now something really starts happening. Viraison signals the beginning of the ripening process, during which, as you can see, the color of the grapes change, the grape berries soften as they build up sugar, and around six days from the start of Viraison, the grape berries begin to grow dramatically as they accumulate glucose and fructose. By September, October, the transformation from tiny, youthful bunt to ripe and bursting grape clusters is complete and it's time for harvest. Many different factors decide when is the best time to start harvesting, um, but the most important one is, of course, 
that the grape berries are fully ripe. Other important factors can be the threat of detrimental weather, which can mean that you will want to harvest earlier if that is in the forecast. Following harvest, the vine will continue to pr produce photosynthesis and it will create carbohydrates to store in the vine's root and trunk. And when winter finally arrives and the leaves start to fall, the wine will enter a dormancy period. In the following spring, a new transformation can begin. The next transformation that the wine goes through happens in the winery. And here we will look at what happens from grape to bottling the finished wine. Different produ production methods exist, of course, depending on which type of wine the winemaker wishes to produce. Today we will look at the transformation that takes place from having the blue ripe grapes in hand to bottling the finished product. And we'll pick up where we finished before with the harvest, which is very much the first step of the winemaking. So we pick the grape, um, bring them on the trolley, bring them back into the winery where they are hand sorted to make sure that only the sound grapes are used. Here the winemaker can also choose to destem the grapes which is, as the word says, we take the stem of the grapes. You would do this as a winemaker if you would like to lower the level of tannin and phenolics and sort of harshness, if you will, sometimes in the finished wine. So now the grapes are ready to be crushed. Gentle pressure is applied. We break the grape skin open and, um, and access the pulp. And this is another important transformation. After the crushing, the grapes are pumped into the fermentation vessel and ready for the alcoholic fermentation, which you have right here. Alcoholic or primary fermentation takes around one to two weeks, during which the yeast, as you can see, converts sugar and water into alcohol and oxygen. The red wine must always be left in contact with the grape skins to extract important phenolics and color. And this process we call maceration. And to aid this extraction of color and phenolics, many different methods exist. There's also, you can also find many different types of fermentation vessels, which can also imply heavily on what the finished wine will look like. Some wines then are not run into barrel, but uh, just go into stainless steel and this way preserve their fruity character. But if we would like to transform the wine in a different way, what many producers do is that they run it into an oak barrel. And this is another important stage because depending on whether the oak barrel has been used or it is new or it is maybe has been used twice or depending on how big or small it is and how how much it has been toasted while it was produced, we will end up with a different type of wine, depending on which barrel we choose to age our wine in. So wine is left to mature in oak barrels anywhere from between three months to three years, sometimes even longer. And finally, it is filtered and stabilized and then run onto bottles. And the transformation from harvest to me being able to taste the finished wine can last anywhere from a few months for Beaujolais Nouveau until uh, over 50 years, maybe for the finest bottles of Madeira, or Bordeaux, or uh, Nebbiolo, that has structure and either sugar, acidity, or tannin to last. So now that we've gone through the initial transformation in the wine's life, let's look at what happens later on. First, let's, let's have a look at what happens inside the bottle when I pull the cork and oxygen goes in. And also, after that, let's have a look at how I can transform my tasting experience by either aerating the wine or serving it at different temperatures or serving it with different types of food. But first, a small word on antioxidants because they play quite an important part here and particularly red wines are ram packed with them. One of the most famous antioxidants are, is called uh, resveratrol. 
It belongs to a group of chemical compounds that is known as phenolics and is produced by the grapevine, by the grapevine, sorry, particularly in response to microbial attacks. So it's sort of a self-defense, if you will. It's also present in the woody parts of the wine where it is thought to protect against wood decay. So all around, it's an antioxidant that the wine produces itself as a self-defense. Many factors in the growing of grapes and the vinification can affect the level of resveratrol in the finished wine. For example, the grape variety or the rootstock used. And also something else that is very important is that resveratrol is one of a few compounds in wine that is thought to contribute to health aspects of its moderate consumption. So I'm sure you've all heard that, uh, I think it, it came out around 10 years ago, that if you drink, instead of eat one apple a day to keep the doctor away, drink a glass of red wine. And I know a lot of people who thought that that was brilliant. Uh, but, and so this is why, or this is one of the main reasons it's a, it's a resveratrol. Another antioxidant is sulfur dioxide, also known as SO2. And this is probably the most used chemical in the winery. It also works as a preservative and protects the wine from spoilage by oxidation or bacteria. And sulfur dioxide is responsible for the words contains sulfites that you find on some wine levels. And although it is produced in very tiny quantities by the vine, it, it, most of what is there is, like I said, added by the winemaker. White wines in general contain much more sulfur dioxide than, or will have added much more sulfur dioxide than red wines, um, because the red wines are richer in the antioxidants that it receives from the phenolics and from the tannins that we extract, um, extract during maceration. Hence, we need to add more sulfur dioxide to white wine. So, back to the chemical transformation that begins once I open my bottle of wine and it is exposed to oxygen. So when the bottle is open, the wine is exposed to air. What happens is that oxygen and antioxidants wage war at the surface of the wine. So if you can imagine, a ball of oxygen rushing towards the wine very fast, then a, a, a molecule of antioxidant will grab this, um, the first uh, ball and throw it back and prevent it from oxidizing the wine. When all the antioxidants in a wine is used up, the oxidation begins. Oxygen penetrates the wine slowly and an open but not decanted bottle of wine will take several hours to be saturated with oxygen. And this process will ultimately transform the wine, hopefully for the better, and in some cases for the worse, when it can turn into vinegar. So let's say that I would like to transform my tasting experience then. I could do that by several different methods. I could do that by aerating my wine, I could play with temperatures, or I could experiment, experiment with food and wine matching. So let's start by looking at aeration. Factors to consider before aerating a bottle of wine, there are two. So if you are at home, you would like to drink, you invest in a nice bottle of wine, and it needs decantation, the first thing you want to consider is which type of wine is it that I have here in front of me, and what is the best way of aerating this specific type of wine? And those two factors are, of course, linked, because the type of wine that I have in front of me will ultimately determine how I should best aerate this wine, and it is very important that I understand the type of wine that I have in front of me for me to be able to treat it in a way that will result in a significant and positive transformation of the wine. For example, is the wine young or old? Is it high in sulfur? Has it seen a lot of air during vinification? So if the wine is young and perhaps a bit too young, it will require a longer and more brutal aeration in order to experience a transformation. So by brutal aeration, I mean cork out, bottoms up, and almost shake it into the decanter. So it comes out re really splashing out, and then you shake 
the decanter as well to make sure that as much oxygen goes into it as possible. If the wine is older or perhaps too old, in some cases the wine needs protection from aeration or it could transform into something very unpleasant, like I mentioned it before, it could transform into vinegar. A wine with low levels of sulfur will transform much quicker than a wine with high levels. It is also important to take into consideration that the wine, the way the wine has been made, for example, if it has been exposed to high levels of oxygen, like a Madeira, it would take weeks or months to experience a change. But that also means that when you open it, wines such as Port, Tawny Port, Madeira, that you can leave it open in your fridge and it can stand there unchanged or untransformed for up to a month at least. So a small note on ways of decanting or aerating wine, which can be done, I think, in three main ways. Start with decanting, which is the process of pouring, as is shown on the picture, the wine in a decanter in order to aerate it. Here time is very important, depending on which style of wine I want to aerate. It could take anywhere from a few minutes up to several hours. Next method is aerators, which is more sort of a modern concept, which you rarely see used in restaurants, probably more at home. And they are sort of accelerator tools that force air to circulate throughout the wine. And the end result is a wine with an expanded aromatic profile and a softer texture. And these are extremely effective, but best suited to young wines, so we can't take an older 1982 Chateau Petrus and pour through this, because it wouldn't be strong enough and that would destroy the wine completely. These, this, the one on the picture is one of the most famous ones, it's called Venturi. Finally, there is glassware, which is not as important as decanters or aerators, but good glassware will definitely change my perception of the wine. For example, if I have an old wine, like I said, that is too fragile to be decanted, different types of glassware will still allow me to change or to transform my drinking experience with a more fragile wine. Another way of, tr of uh, transforming the tasting experience is by playing with temperatures. Because the temperature at which a wine is served has a profound effect on how it smells and tastes. So the higher the temperature, the more aromas will be released and the more volatile compounds will evaporate from the surface of the wine. And on the contrary, the cooler the wine is, the more subdued and unexpressed it would be. This is why if you have a wine that is not very good, that has a flaw uh, or, or maybe forks in the winemaking, if you serve it very cold, it will be harder to notice. Temperature also has an effect on the perception of sweetness, acidity, and alcohol in the wine. So lower temperatures will reduce my perception of sweetness and alcohol while it will intensify the acidity. That's why, that's why it makes sense to serve sweet wines very cold, around eight to 10 degrees to make them appear more balanced and less cloying, slightly more refreshing and elegant. The same principle applies to white wine. We want to enhance the freshness and acidity, so we serve it cooler. And again, depending on wine type, it's hard to generalize, but that would be somewhere in between 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. Cool temperatures also have a, has a very big impact on sparkling wines due to the carbon dioxide that is present to the bubbles that are present in sparkling wine. The higher the serving temperature, the more carbon dioxide is released from within the wine, which means that the bubbles are getting bigger and the sparkle would, to us, feel rather chunky and unpleasant the warmer we serve the wine. So served at the correct temperature, the same sparkling wine would taste refreshing and light and the bubble would feel much lighter and again, more elegant and more graceful. When it comes to red wine, it is generally recommended to serve them at slightly higher temperatures because higher temperatures will soften our perception of tannin while increasing the acidity 
and maximizing the impact of the wine's aroma. Another place where we can transform and enhance our tasting experience is by pairing the wine with food. So let's start with some positive examples, shall we? An appropriate choice of food can enhance the wine tasting experience, and in some ways it can even transform the way that we perceive the wine for the better. We start with muscadi and oysters. I'm sure some of you must have tried them. The mineral notes and the yes, okay. The mineral notes and the high acidity of the wine will compare com will um, combine perfectly with the purity and those iodine flavors of the oysters. So both will enhance each other. Next one is sautern and tatata, also a very classic pairing. And here the acidity of the apple will counterbalance that sort of rich, unctuous character of the sautern and the two will be in perfect harmony together. Finally, there's a souffle and champagne, which is one of my own specialties from when I worked in a restaurant not so long ago. I think they go perfectly well together because I think that the aerated, sort of that aerated, fluffy texture of the souffle complements the bubbles in the champagne, and together they sort of in a funny way, create a new texture and a new sort of graceful place of being. On the negative side, though, because we have to do that as well, so we can avoid it, here are examples of some chemicals that naturally clash with food. We start with cinnarin, which is present in artichokes. On most people's palate, cinnarin creates sweetness where there isn't any sweetness. So this will result in that if I were to serve a nice young Sancerre, very fresh, very singy, very high in acidity, with artichokes, the wine will start tasting strange and unpleasantly sweet. On other people's palate, cinnarin, or this sort of reaction is reversed, and cinnarin can make everything taste bitter. So that is one to avoid. The next one is allicin, which is present in onions and responsible for the pungent sort of taste and smell of onions, which over overpower most wines. So that's another one to avoid. The next one is methyl mercaptan, which is also present in asparagus. Um, sorry, the first one was artichokes. This one is asparagus, but another one to avoid. It brings out a vegetal character in, about, in the wine. So if I have a very ripe and round and perfectly balanced wine, and I serve it with asparagus, the asparagus will bring out an, a not very pleasant vegetal character in the wine. Last one is egg yolks. Also very difficult to pair with wine because egg yolks tend to sort of coat the palate and thus diminishing a wine's aroma and texture. So an elegant, again, an elegant and delicate wine can transform into something tasteless and thin on the palate if I serve it with something with raw egg yolks. So while food does not fundamentally change the stru structure or the composition of a wine, our perception, like I said, can be strongly enhanced or the opposite by pairing the wine with either the wrong or the right food. And this, I find in many ways, is one of the most essential parts of sommelierie. Finally, I would like to talk about what happened during a wine's bottle aging. First, looking into factors that will affect a wine's bottle aging, which wines age well and why do they age well. Then we will look into the chemical transformation that happens inside the bottle while it is aging. And to conclude this, we will taste the same wine from three different vintages, so you can experience this transformation yourself on your own palate. So when a wine is allowed to age, extraordinary changes can occur, which, increase, which will increase both the wine's complexity and its monetary value. So let's look quickly at which factors affect how well a wine will age. Vintage characteristics, so in general, 
Only wines from the best, very best vintages are strong enough and has a structural composition which will allow them to age well. The next one is the origin of wine. Needless to say that a wine that is grow grown in a cool climate will have a different structure which will make it age differently from a wine that has been grown in a hot climate. Winemaking methods, for example, as we touched earlier as well, if I choose to barrel age my wine, it will age very differently than if I age it in stainless steel. And finally, there's pH. And in general, you say that it, the lower a wine's pH, the longer it is capable of aging. Two last points in general for red wines are the higher the phenolics and the flavor compounds, the better a wine will age. So if I age, if I take a wine from, made from Nebbiolo or Cabernet Sauvignon, it will age much longer than a wine made from Pinot Noir because of the higher amount of phenolics and flavor compounds. For whites, there's general rule that the higher the level of acidity and flavor precursor, the better the wine will age. And here good examples are uh, grape varieties such as Riesling or uh, Loire Valley Chenin Blanc, and that is also what we will taste later. Other factors that affect how wine will age are bottle sizes, the smaller the bottle size, the faster its content will mature because of the greater, greater proportion of oxygen per centiliter in the bottle. Because the bottleneck and the oulage around the neck will remain the same regardless if it's a normal bottle size or it's a 375 milliliter bottle size. So you can, um, you can work out that there will be more oxygen present in the half bottles, thus they will age faster. And in general, large bottle formats are thought the best for aging. The next point is closures. And also depending on the type of closure used, wine will age very differently. Today, producers have a very wide choice between Stelvin screw cap, Noma cork, Vino Lock, um, DM cork, and normal cork. And the most debated about, I think, today are uh, the use of either normal or traditional cork or Stelvin screw cap. And the screw cap versus cork discussion is a very long and I think very exciting one, but one that will have to be saved for another time. Many different experiences are being had and many different exper experiments are being made. I will share with you an, experiment, an experience that I had some months ago when I was in Bonn in Burgundy, very kindly invited by the uh, Birch family from Western Australia. We tasted our way through four different flights of wine, both red and white wines with different levels of age, with the purpose of comparing wines bottled under screw cap and wines bottled under cork. And by the end of the day, it was apparent to me that at least on that particular occasion, there was no doubt that the wines that was bottled on the screw cap had aged much better. And by better, I mean much slower and with less bottle variation than the wines that were sealed with cork. The final point is sulfur dioxide, which we talked about earlier as well the antioxidant that preserves and protects the wine from spoilage by bacteria and oxygen. And the presence and level of sulfur dioxide in a wine is also a very significant factor as to how long the wine will age. Then a couple of, I know, I know we all want to get to the wine, but just first, a couple of key conditions for storing wine, if you should ever feel like doing that at home. Because if we don't store the wine correctly, again, the wine will be destroyed. Wine is a very sort of uh, special creature, a very, um, a very fragile creature. So there are three overall key conditions for storing wine. Temperature and light. If the wine is kept too hot or exposed to too strong light, it will very quickly decline and oxidize. If it is kept too cold, it can freeze. Its contents will expand and push out the cork, and that's not so good either. So an average temperature of between 10 to 15 degrees Celsius is usually desired. After that, humidity 
a level of around 75% relative humidity is usually recommended because at this degree, the end of the cork won't dry out and fall into the bottle. And now onto the really interesting part, what actually happens to the composition of the wine during maturation and aging. So in general, during the process of maturation and aging, the most um, significant change in the wine happens to the color. In red wines, those purple and red colors and sort of very vibrant dark colors are replaced by orange and brick colors. And this is a bit technical, but I would still try, like to try to explain it to you. In young red wines, the red color is due to monomeric and to cyanin pigments, which are extracted from the skin of the grape during fermentation. The anthocyanin pigments later couple up with tannins and gradually replace the monomeric form with a polymeric form. During maturation, when the wine is exposed to air and oxygen, which plays an enormous role in the reaction between anthocyanins and tannins and results in the end in the formation of more st stable polymeric pigments. As the wine matures and more polymeric pigments are formed, the color shifts from red to orange and brick red and at the same time, when these polymers have reached a certain size, they precipitate out of the wine as brown sediment and result in a wine with reduced astringency and a smoother and softer taste. So there you go. Also in a wine's aroma, significant changes take place during maturation and aging. The flavor compounds that are responsible for the primary aromas, which come from the grape, and the secondary aromas, which comes from the production and the fermentation, they integrate and combine and form tertiary aromas, which are those produced during a wine's aging. So in short, the grape-derived derived aromas fade, and we're gonna taste that now, and more complex aromas develop. So now I would like some of you to taste with me. I have brought today three different vintages of Vaubray Demisec from Touraine in the Loire Valley. And we will taste them and talk about which characteristics and transformations we experience. And so a small correction here, we're tasting first 2014, then we are moving on to 2009, and then we finish with 2002. <laughs> okay, so here we are. So what we want to do is to look at the transformation that takes place in this bottle of white wine. So it is the three different types. They're all Vaubray, they're all demi sec, they're from the same producer and have been brought up in the same cellar. So the only thing that has changed is vintage. 2014 first. If you start by looking at the color, it's a very pale, very pale, very green straw, a pale straw. Do you all agree with that? There's no rim variation. It's sort of, there's a silvery, some people would say a watery rim, but it's a very youthful character that we have. <laughs> then if you, ooh, if you smell the wine. So the nose is all about primary fruit. It's all about youthful, crisp, fresh, vibrant, green apples, green gauge, green pear, minerality, there's no question that these wines are very mineral, stony, there's a hint of honey, do you all agree with that? Anything to add here on the nose? I agree. You agree? Anything to add? Would you like to add anything? To add? To add? No, I'll push on the mineral uh, aspect. Yeah. I'm so sorry. If you can just stay with us, please. No, please. Come on, no, see. It's not respectable. It's not respectful for the speaker. It's unbelievable. So, anything else to add? Focus on the minerality and youthful characters of fruit. Let's taste the wine.
Here again, a very useful character of fruit, slightly riper character of fruit on the palette, more perhaps Mirabelle, but we can confirm the same fruits that we found on the nose, more honey, hint of honeysuckle maybe. Yeah. Anything to add to that? So a bit more generosity on the palette, more minerality on the nose. And I think in the structure, acidity, there's freshness on the palate and there's youth. Do you agree? It's sweeter than it smells. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So anything to add to that? Or shall we move on to the next vintage? Tati. I'm so sorry. I just need to, to precise a bit that we have different bottles for most of you who want to test afterwards. It's not possible to do it on the stage, but we have plenty of glasses and also wine. So everybody wants to test after it could be possible. <laughs> The wine is from, they're all from Beauvray, which is an appellation in uh, Touraine and the Loire Valley. Very famous for their Chinin Blanc. Pouilly aspect also, the minerality of this Pouilly aspect. Pouilly? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quite right, yeah. Very much, oh, there's no doubt these wines are very, very mineral. So let's first have a look at the color of the next wine. And again, you will all have the opportunity to have a look at this after and to smell and taste and experience this transformation yourself. Let's have a look at the color. It's always easier to look at color of a wine if we have a white background. We don't have that today, but still I think that you will all agree with me in saying that the color is more golden. It's slightly more golden. Maybe not golden yet, it's more yellow. It's more uh, straw, darker straw. And there's a slight rim variation. Yeah, it's not so silvery in the edge anymore. It's slightly more golden in the edge than if you smell the wine. Exactly. So here we start having more secondary aromas coming through. So aromas from the winemaking, from the oak, which is older, larger barrels. So it's not a very strong presence of oak. It's more sort of a rounding, and it gives a bit, it gives a hint of spice and a softness, sort of a buttery element to the wine. Also, what has happened to the fruit, I think, is that it has become, is a riper character of fruit. 
It's more sort of a jammy, almost like orange or quince marmalade that you have here. Will you agree with me? Yeah. Apricot, definitely apricot. Some mushroomy notes, more earthy character. And let's taste the wine. So on the palate, again, we can confirm the aromas we found on the nose, but it's a riper character of aromas that are on the palate. And the acidity is more integrated. What do you think? It's more earthy, yes? Yeah, yeah. So it's like everything starts to integrate in the wine, where in the 2014, it was sticking out a bit. Okay, the sugar is here. The acidity is here. So the different flavors are here. In this wine, you can start feeling how all of these different parts of its competition starts coming together. So we feel them a, a little less, yeah. and it's a bit more balanced. Yeah. Rounded, integrated, yes. Yes. Yeah. So finally, 2002 in the glass, which I should start by saying is one of the greatest vintages for Chinam Blanc in the Loire Valley in the past uh, 25 years. Start by looking at the color. Certainly a transformation in color. Now we can talk about golden. There's a rim variation. Do you all agree over here? Have you had a look, look at the color? Yeah. So if you smell the wine, try to smell it. Now tell me, what is the first thing that you smell? Meat, okay, yeah, yeah. Barbecue, okay. You know what I can smell? Truffle. Can you all smell that? Truffle, mushrooms, earth, beeswax, Exactly, autumn is a truffle hunter wine, maybe even. <laughs> Anything to add on the nose? Still all the fruit is there, but then it's, again, it's uh, riper, it's more sort of marmalade more quincy, again, more mirabelle, but a riper style fruit, maybe slightly, even slightly mashed. Orange peel, caramelized orange peel, do you all follow me? So let's, pardon? Well, the mineral has changed a little bit because the mineral has been replaced by, from being a tertiary, or a primary note in the first wine, to the tertiary character now. So it's much deeper and it's much more integrated in the wine. And what we feel most of all is, is, are the tertiary aromas, which are the truffle and, and those sorts of notes. Let's taste this wine then. Thank you. 
So this wine is almost drier, the driest, I think, of the three, actually, surprising. Less sweet. So here, the sugar and the sweetness is integrated in the wine. The acidity is more integrated in the wine. All the flavors are more integrated in the wine. So what we have in the end is a more balanced, more elegant wine. Which one is your favorite? So if we say nine, hands up, who preferred the 2009? Okay. Very good. That was, a, that was the middle one. How about the first one then? 2014, very close. Yeah, definitely. How about the 2002 then? Well, I think 2002 is the winner. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, that's the amazing thing, especially with wines like this, that you can choose to open them at different times according to what you would like from the wine. Yeah? No, thank you. Thank you. I would like to talk to you very briefly about wine as an investment. So let's briefly have a look at which factors decide the market price of a wine and often influencing whether this price later will increase or decrease. First of all, prestige and quality. After, rarity value, is it a tiny production? Is it a tiny vintage? Is it a prestige cuvée? Then provenance and condition. How many times has the wine changed hands? Has it traveled? How has it been stored? Like I mentioned earlier, if the storage has been poor, the wine could have been destroyed. And that lowers the market value or the market price of the wine. After vintage, as well as we touched earlier, uh, stellar vintage or top vintage will be able to age for much longer because of a stronger composition and will also, because of that, get a much higher market price. Then there are ratings from critics and writers, which is, of course, very important. I'm sure you've all heard about Robert Parker. So in many instances, what he thinks can change a wine's price overnight. Then there's the general state of the market. Is it buyer's or is it seller's market? And finally, supply versus demand, because fine wine is produced in strict finite quantities. And because of that, heightened global demand drives up the value of the wine that remains in the market. So every time a new market emerges, demand is increased. A good example is in the late 90s when the Asian economy boomed, prices of the most prestigious investment wines skyrocketed following that. Another thing that can increase demand is favorable exchange rate. A good example is a massive interest that was in the United States for the Bordeaux 1982. And that was partly down to the strength of the American dollar versus the French Frank in 1983, when most of the imprimeur purchases was made. Finally, Mahesh Kumar writes in his book, Wine Investment for Portfolio Diversification, about the life of an investment in wine. And it goes like this. Investment grade wine can have a lifespan of up to 50 years. There's a sharp rise for six to 18 months following the release of the wine. And in the lesser years, prices can fall during this period. The value then stabilizes or rises at a slower rate until the wine becomes ready to consume, normally after 15 to 20 years. After this period, stocks start to diminish and prices start to rise once more. The wine then continues to mature and prices rise until the end of the wine's life. The theme of transformation in wine is so vast that I couldn't possibly have covered it all today. And to give you an example, it should have been very interesting to dive much more into topics such as wine training, closures, as we talked about, varietals, terroirs, how does terroir affect uh, different grape varieties, closures, clones, and many more. The world of wine is in constant movement and transformation, hence why it has always fascinated me greatly and I hope it has fascinated you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. We have some um, time just to prepare the, the, the bottles and the glass that you can use. Um, maybe some of you has any, any question. Yes, you have a question. Yes. Hi. Uh, I've been told that because of the, uh, of the rise of the Asian market, uh, people wanted to consume more quickly, and now uh, wine was made to be consumed very quickly. Is that true? Um, yes and no. It is true that a lot of wine is produced so that it can both be enjoyed young and it can also age. Um, I think a, a good example is our American cold wines, such as Cabernet Sauvignon uh, from Napa Valley. They are very plush, they're very round, the tannins are ripe, they're generous, they can certainly be enjoyed now and they can age as well. I think the main point here is that if you want, as a winemaker, to make a lot of people happy without that sounding wrong, then you would try to target everyone. So someone does, so some winemakers does that and produce ripe and plush wine that can be enjoyed young and that can age as well. But there's certainly still a lot, a lot of wines that are produced to age and for, inv and for investment purposes as well. Yes. Um, so there's actually a new trend going back to um, ecologic wine, wine without sulfites, for example, just pure wine. And I was wondering, is there a real taste difference between like ecological wine and re regularly produced wine? I don't know if I expressed myself well. Yeah, I think that there is. Well, firstly, um, ecolo ecologically produced wine could be several things. It could be biodynamic wine, it could be organic, or it could be natural wine today. I think the wines that are most famous for having uh, very below maybe 10 milligrams per liter or no sulfur at all are the natural wines. And you can certainly taste the difference because I find that when you open the cork on a, a young, a, a very youthful uh, primary wine, it has already, already developed slightly. Does that make sense? And I experienced in, in the restaurant where I was working um, in, at Suma in London that a guest brought a wine that he would like to drink at his table and he said, and it was a white wine and it was natural, so there was no sulfite added, so nothing to protect the wine. And he said to me, can you please decant that wine? And I was like, yep, yeah, sure, if you like. So I decanted it. And so to begin with, the wine was very sort of youthful, yellow, straw in color. And I'm not kidding, I think 15 minutes later, it was already significantly darker. And so I went to him and said, so uh, this is your wine, so it's, are we sure everything is okay here? Oh yeah, yeah, this is how it normally is, okay. And then half an hour later, it was even darker, and by the evening, it was orange. So you can feel a difference, and also, like I mentioned earlier, Sulfites protects the wine. So without sulfites, the wine doesn't have anything to protect it. But today, natural wine is sort of a whole cult thing with a lot of followers and can be enjoyed for its own special reasons, I suppose, as well. Yes? Very, very last question. So please, we can take the two questions, the two of you, one All for right, you and just, just behind you, because after, if you want to have time to test a bit, Got it. <laughs> no more questions. So the last two questions, you two, please. All right, thank you. A uh, little bit of an odd question, but uh, I was wondering, is there a, some sort of an underdog country which produce really good wine and nobody really knows about, uh, where you would say, I mean, you know, Chile, you know, Australia, and of course, also well, then Africa. Am I, I would say Denmark. Denmark, really, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> no, Denmark is more about beer, let me think. Well, there's a lot of up-and-coming countries in, <clears throat> in Eastern Europe. For example, Hungary, well, that's been happening for a while now, but they were traditionally very famous for Tokai and for sweet wines. And I think since the mid-2000s, they've started producing a lot of dry table wines, which are delicious. 
but also Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria. There's a lot of things happening there. So that's probably where I would look. Oh, in countries like Brazil, Uruguay, which is also up and coming in, in South America. <laughs> and the last question, yes. What's your personal um, opinion of uh, German Riesling? I love them. <laughs> you have just very last question of it there. She wants, she wants uh, just there, uh, yeah. Very last one. So actually I've been storing um, one bottle of wine for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wait for a moment to open it, but I don't want to drink it at once. So um, this is a red wine, and um, it's pretty old. So how long can I store it in a fridge, like opened after it's aerated? It's a aerated? personal question. <laughs> how, how old is it? Just a um, 83. 83, I would say. When you open it, you will have to plan to drink it. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 